Good morning, and welcome to the Congregational Church of Austin, United Church of Christ. My name is Tom, and as we like to say in United Church of Christ, whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here with us. Now, if you are new to our church or our worship gathering, and if you have any questions about our church or our ministry, feel free to send us an email at the email address listed below. We are gathering in the season of Epiphany, and throughout the season of Epiphany, we will be lighting our Epiphany Christ candle. So I hope that you have a candle at home with you so that you can light your candle with us as we share the light and celebrate the light of Christ together. So as we continue with our worship, may the peace of Christ and the light of Christ be with you. We now light our Epiphany Christ candle as we will throughout the season of Epiphany. Jesus said, you have no doubt heard that you should hate your enemy. In fact, it's written in some of your Psalms. Hate your enemies and God's enemy with a perfect hatred. Call on God to kill them. Well, Jesus said, I'm telling you not to hate your enemy, but to love your enemy. That's right. Love your enemy. Disregard those who teach hatred or preach hatred or in any way justify hatred. Love your enemy. That's God's way and that's the truth. Love your enemy. That's one of the greatest spiritual challenges we face. Loving our enemy. It's right up there with forgiving those who hurt us, or worse, who hurt those we love. That's hard. Love our enemy. How can we bring ourselves to love our enemy? Maybe one way to practice loving our enemy is to look for the light that's shining in people who disturb us, in people who offend us, in people we find abhorrent, in people who call us their enemy. The light shines in all people, and we often don't see it or look for it or even want to see it in the people we can't stand. Just as the people who can't stand us often don't see it or look for it or want to see it in us. Not seeing the light in another just increases the darkness. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness that is within all people the darkness within which all people live, and the darkness cannot overcome the light. So let's practice looking for the light in all people. And let us try to make the light shining in us easier for other people to see.
for my worship gift, I'd like to read Langston Hughes' Let America Be America Again. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great, strong land of love where never kings connive, no tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery's scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker sold to the machine. I am the Negro servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean, hungry yet today, despite the dream, beaten yet today, oh pioneers, I am the man who never got ahead, the poorest worker bartered through the years. Yet I'm the one who dreamt our basic dream in the old world, while still a serf of kings, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turned, that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lee and torn from black Africa's strand I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me, surely not me. The millions on relief today the millions shot down when we strike, the millions who have nothing for our pay, for all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay, except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again. The, the land that never has been yet, and yet must be, the land where every man is free, 
the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again. America. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. Thank you. Good morning. Our reading this morning comes from Psalm 139, lines 1 through 18. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed in my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance in your book were written. All the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. In the verses we read from Psalm 139, the psalmist speaks to God and goes to great lengths to convince God that God knows everything there is to know about the psalmist. The psalmist tells God that God knows the psalmist through and through, backwards and forwards, inside out, because it was God who knit the psalmist together. God knows every muscle and bone, every nerve and organ, every cell and synapse. God knows the psalmist's every thought before the psalmist even thinks it, every feeling before the psalmist feels it, 
every move before the psalmist makes it, every word before the psalmist speaks it. Heck, even before God created this person, God knew everything about this person, every day of this person's life. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance, the psalmist writes. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, yet when none of them as yet existed. And there's no place the psalmist can go to hide from God. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to heaven, there you are. If I go to Sheol, there you are. I can't sneak behind your back, hide anything from you, keep any secret from you. You know everything about me. Now why does the psalmist go to such great lengths to convince God that God knows everything about the psalmist. Because the psalmist wants to convince God that the psalmist hates the people who are God's enemies and wants God to kill them. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you, the psalmist asks. I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Oh, that you would kill them. The verses that we read from Psalm 139 this morning were verses 1 to 18. And those verses are among the most beautiful, profound, and moving in the Bible. To be intimately known by the God who created us, the God who knew us as we are today, before we were even born, the God whose presence we can never leave, the God from whom we can never be separated. Many people find great spiritual comfort in the first 18 verses of Psalm 139. But verse 19 brings a dramatic shift in the psalm, one that reveals another side of the psalmist. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O oh God, those who speak maliciously of you, those who rise up to do evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Oh, that you would kill them. That's why the psalmist spends the first 18 verses convincing God that God knows the psalmist through and through. To convince God that the psalmist hates God's enemies and wants God to kill them. The psalmist seems concerned that God doubts the veracity and authenticity of the psalmist's hatred. So the psalmist needs to convince God with the most beautiful, profound, and moving language the psalmist can conjure up. That if the psalmist's hatred isn't perfect and pure, God will know. Because God knows everything about the psalmist. The psalm feels a lot different when we read the entire psalm, which is why we don't. When we read 
this psalm liturgically during worship, we always stop at verse 18. We readily acknowledge and welcome into our worship the side of the psalmist that inspires us and comforts us. But we don't acknowledge and we exclude from our worship the side of the psalmist that disturbs us and offends us. In other words, we take a one-dimensional view of a multi-dimensional human being. And I think we do the psalmist and ourselves a profound disservice when we reduce the psalmist's humanity to one dimension, the one we like, the one we approve of, the one that inspires us and comforts us, and then black out the part we don't like, ignore it, refuse to acknowledge it, exclude it from our worship. Yet this seems to be a common occurrence, especially in our time of extreme polarization. One-dimensional views of multi-dimensional human beings. We don't see, we don't even want to see what may be offensive and disturbing in the people we admire and think of as good, even spiritual. And we don't see, don't even want to see what may be good, even spiritual, in those we find offensive and disturbing. A one-dimensional view of multi-dimensional people. It's great fuel for hatred and violence. And there's a lot of that fuel around right now. Limiting ourselves to reading verses 1 to 18 of Psalm 139, it's hard to imagine anything disturbing or unsettling about the person who wrote those beautiful and inspiring words. But if we were to limit ourselves to reading verses 19 to 24, it would be hard to imagine anything good or spiritual about the person who wrote those disturbing and offensive words. With just a partial reading, we get a one-dimensional view, good or bad, which is a highly distorted view, and therefore a false view of this person. It's only when we read the entire psalm that we get a fuller and truer view of this complex and multidimensional human being, whose qualities run the gamut from sublime spiritual beauty to hatred and a lust for violence. And it's only when we read the entire psalm that we ourselves are challenged to look at other people in our nation and world today, and at ourselves as well, through multidimensional lenses that run the full gamut instead of a one-dimensional lens that reduces people in order to get a fuller and truer view and a better understanding of who other people are in all of their complexity and who we are in all of ours. As we noted this morning, it is the darkness in our own hearts that makes us not even want to see the light in those who disturb and defend us. So let us shine light by looking for the light in all other people. Amen.
continued support of the Congregational Church of Austin, United Church of Christ. Because of the light of your generosity, the light of your love and care for this church, for one another, and for our ministry, we are able to continue on through this difficult time, being a Christ-like presence to one another, being a Christ-like presence in this world. So again, thank you for your generosity, for your love, for your continued support of the Congregational Church of Austin. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of life and the gift of new life that we receive through the living Christ. In response, we offer you these gifts and we offer you our very lives. And we pray that they may be transformed into ministry that brings your liberating, healing, reconciling love to your creation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Sisters, brothers, kindred in Christ, may Christ's light shine within you and may it shine from you upon others. When others are feeling hatred or fear, may you love them. Where others are injured, may you bring a healing presence to them. When others are struggling with doubt, May you restore their trust. When others are suffering from despair, may you instill hope in them. When others are sad, may you bring them joy. May you shine in the darkness. May the darkness not overcome you. And may the darkness not overcome others because of the light of Christ that you shine upon them.
we are.